What's going on everyone? I hope this video finds you well. My name is Jonathan Riddell and today we are going to solve a quantum many body Hamiltonian called the XX model. The spin one half XX model will give us a useful and fun playground to explore topics like thermal properties, uh, Wick's theorem, eigenstate thermalization, entanglement, and phase transitions. With this in mind, let's jump right into it. The model we're going to solve is a toy model for magnetism and is written in the following way. The terms here are the usual spin one half operators in the x, y, and z directions. The Hamiltonian describes spins on a one-dimensional chain uh, interacting and the chain will have periodic boundary conditions. This means that we'll have terms that connect the lth spin to the first spin. The interactions come from nearest neighbor interactions in the x and y directions and the last sum term is a magnetic field applied to the z direction of the spins. J here, or capital J here, controls the strength um, and type of the interactions we have. It can be either positive or negative, and lambda controls the strength of the magnetic field. The first thing that we're going to want to do uh, to solve this problem is put our Hamiltonian in a form that we can employ the Jordan-Wigner transformation to transform the problem to a fermionic picture. But Be before we do that, we need to convert our Hamiltonian to raising and lowering operators. And just before we proceed here, if you don't know what the Jordan-Wigner transformation is, I have a standalone video on that. I'll put the link in the description. You should go watch that before proceeding in this video. Our first step is to transform our Hamiltonian to raising and lowering operators, as they are often written in the following way. Reorganizing these definitions for the raising and lowering operators, we come to the definitions for the spin x and the spin y operator. We can then sub these definitions into the Hamiltonian. Subbing in these definitions gives us back the following Hamiltonian. This new Hamiltonian can be understood quite straightforwardly uh, just looking at the Z basis of the spins. The interacting terms simply flip neighboring spins if they are anti-aligned. So to see this, consider a two-body problem in the state spin down and spin up. Here we see the first spin flip term, uh, S plus S minus, uh, flips the first state up and the second one down. The second spin flip term uh, destroys the state because we have S1 minus and S2 plus, uh, which in both cases uh, destroys the state on the individual site. But note that if both spins were up or both spins were down, nothing would happen with the spin flip term in the Hamiltonian. So we see that from this exercise, uh, a straightforward consequence of this is that the Hamiltonian uh, has a total magnetization symmetry. And what we mean by that is that if we ever apply the Hamiltonian, maybe for dynamics or any other purpose, uh, the Hamiltonian preserves the total magnetization of our state in the Z basis. Okay, so now it's time to turn our attention to the Jordan-Wigner transformation. So again, if you haven't already, uh, you should take a look at my video on this transformation as we will just assume some results uh, that we worked out in that video. The transformation is given by the following expressions. So these Fs here are fermionic creation and annihilation operators. And a key result of the previous video was that spin flipping for the nearest neighbors is identical to fermionic hopping nearest neighbors. And of course, we can go in the opposite direction by taking the Hermitian conjugate and we see the following term. So of course we could apply this to the whole Hamiltonian, but there's a subtle problem here uh, on the boundary, so we can't straightforwardly just rewrite our Hamiltonian as a fermionic Hamiltonian yet. If we look directly at the spin flipping term on the boundary, uh, say S plus on the lth lattice site and S minus on the uh, first lattice site, we see the following expression come out of the Jordan-Wigner transformation, which is a highly non-local term. In fact, it takes in fermionic operators uh, that come from everywhere on the lattice. 
So this expression is of course extremely non-local. It contains fermionic operators from the whole lattice. Um, so let's compress it a bit with the notation of the previous video and insert the notation uh, Q. So writing out our Hamiltonian here in terms of the fermionic operators, we see that we have a part of our Hamiltonian that can be cleanly written in terms of nearest neighbor hopping, uh, in terms of fermionic creation and annihilation operators. Uh, here in the first portion. The second portion, um, our whole magnetic field term was cleanly transformed into terms of number operators. So that transformation uh, was quite clean. But we see the boundary term uh, is an issue here. So here we are going to add and subtract a term to the Hamiltonian so that the nearest neighbor hopping term in the Hamiltonian can also have periodic boundary conditions as it currently uh, does not connect the first lattice site uh, to the elf lattice site or the last lattice site. So if we do that, we now have three terms in the Hamiltonian. The first is again fermions hopping on a cyclic lattice. Second is a potential on the lattice for the fermions. And the third term that we have here does not contain a sum over all of the sites and should only contribute on order of one over L to any macroscopic quantities that we're interested in computing. This can be justified uh, more rigorously, but for now we will simply drop this term uh, since we will be interested in computing things in the thermodynamic limit. So our new Hamiltonian now can be uh, written quite cleanly as the following expression where we just have fermions hopping on a periodic lattice and lambda provides a potential to that lattice. We also have a constant term here, which is a surviving term from the Jordan-Wigner transformation, which has the uh, spin one half uh, Z operator maps to a number operator minus one half. So now we can exploit the fact that all of our operators obey fermionic algebra and our lattice is cyclic. The way we can exploit the cyclic property of our lattice is by performing a discrete Fourier transform on the fermions, where K here is a discrete momenta. Each K is given to us by the following expression, where M is an integer that we find between one and L. The reverse transformation back to local fermionic operators is of course given by the following expression. And these operators also obey the standard fermionic anti-commutation relations. An interesting thing to note here is that the vacuum state of the local fermions is the same as the vacuum state of the fermionic momentum operators dk. As we will see, this is of course not always the case and not all mappings that we'll be interested in will preserve this property. So before we jump into diagonalizing the Hamiltonian or applying this discrete Fourier transform, uh, we need one extra identity to proceed, which is the consistency condition of the Fourier transform. For now, we will take it for granted, uh, but in the future, I'll probably make a short sort of explaining how this identity works. Uh, the consistency condition is written in the following way. So what exactly is this telling us? It's telling us that if we sum over all of these complex numbers, the result is zero if our discrete momenta k and q are different, or if they are the same, we just end up getting, we just end up summing up one a whole bunch of times, so it sums to L, which is the system size or the number of lattice sites. With this in mind, uh, we can now uh, apply the transformation to our Hamiltonian. So subbing it in, we can then interchange the sums and make the J-dependent sum as the innermost sum. We know from our previous identity that this summation over J is only non-zero if our discrete momenta are identical. So K has to be equal to Q. And therefore, we can simplify the sum to the following expression. Similarly, for hopping in the opposite direction gives the following expression. And for the on-site potential, we just map a sum of number operators to a sum of number operators. So now we can write down our model again. Uh, we see that the model can be rewritten completely in terms of these discrete momenta operators as the following Hamiltonian. This can of course be simplified 
uh, to the following expression written here. So this form is, of course, uh, really simple, but we're going to simplify it just a little bit more to simplify our discussion. The first thing that we're going to do is we are going to remove the constant term, uh, lambda L over 2, uh, because that is independent of the momentum operator, so it's ju it just amounts to a constant shift of our Hamiltonian or of our matrix. So that just shifts the energy eigenvalues by a constant value. And of course, we're usually interested in differences of eigenvalues. And the second, we are going to uh, denote our eigenmodes or these cosine expressions with the symbol epsilon k. So our final Hamiltonian is a free fermionic Hamiltonian, like a non-interacting free fermionic Hamiltonian in the following expression. So we've seen an expression like this before, but it's basically just telling us that we have a bunch of fermionic modes that we can put a fermion into, and each fermion mode comes with a corresponding energy, epsilon k. So this final expression, the model is solved completely, and we can do a lot with this. But for now, we will simpl simply summarize uh, two interesting facts. First of all, all of the energy eigenvectors can be constructed with the fermionic momentum operators, or the creation operators, starting from the vacuum state. For example, a random energy eigenket could be built something like the following expression. So E is equal to dk dagger dq dagger uh, applied to the uh, vacuum state. And the corresponding energy would just be a sum of the energy eigenmodes for which that mode is occupied by a fermion. So that's the energy eigenkets. What about thermal properties? Well, if you watch my video on the Fermi Dirac distribution or you are familiar with it, you will probably notice right away that the number operators uh, will obey a Fermi Dirac distribution um, in the grand canonical ensemble. So there we have it. Uh, this is a great starting point to explore a number of topics. Uh, but for now, we'll leave this as a standalone video. Uh, I hope the solution of the model uh, was clear. Definitely ask questions uh, if there were uh, confusions in the video or I didn't explain things clearly. Uh, but that's it for today, guys. If you liked the video, feel free to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below.